so thank you very much. Uh, I realize this is called a colloquium. That means to speak together. So you can ask me questions and interrupt me at any time. Um, I try to cover a lot of ground. I, as Jerry was saying, I am broadly interested. It's always about finding the signal behind the noise, in a way, or finding the model behind the grossness of data, as George Backus would say, for inaccurate, incomplete, and insufficient. Um, so if I run over time, it's not out of disrespect, but out of enthusiasm for the subject. And feel free to just sort of stop me. Um, I should also, of course, acknowledge a host of collaborators over the, over the years, um, just alphabetically. Kieran Began, Tony Dahlin, Ingrid Dobshi, Shinchan Han, Jessica Hawthorne, Bob Kopp, Ignace Loris, Jeremy Trevika, Chris Nolet, C.K. Shum, Lei Wang, Mark Wazork. There's a variety of others. You know, one never works alone. Uh, however, all the errors are mine, as they say. So um, uh, this isn't looking as good as I was hoping. It's going to be um, having these dots there. Let's see if they bother us. It's going to be, th oh, no, it does bother me. Can I switch to preview instead of read? Because this didn't appear when I did it, luckily. Oops. Then this uh, pointer won't work, but I don't worry about that. Okay. Okay, that didn't change it. It's a projector. <laughs> it's for real. Um, so I'm going to give you three examples, ultimately, that, that will show you that this sort of stuff is useful. You know, it'll be an example of studying large earthquakes using time variable gravity, something or rather a bulk of it about studying the seismic structure of the Earth via these new techniques. And then also as an add-on, um, I will, or in the last bit of it, I will just very briefly show you how this is all connected to that work that indeed Bob Kopp and I and Jerry and Adam Maloof, Michael Oppenheimer did on, on past global sea level fluctuations in a general sense. So three questions. You know, the first question is something very basic, and it's asking this one. What can we learn about the geophysical signal from its samples? Okay. Um, here's my signal, S, could be a vector, of spatial temporal position. And we're going to always be making samples. We're going to always sample it. So there will be a delta x, the delta t, as in, in classical introduction to signal processing. And now the samples are just indexed by their uh, number. And Nyquist, or Nyquist, Harry Nyquist and Claude Shannon, uh, back in the days, and this is a long time ago, came up with some very simple rules of dealing with sampling. And in one sentence, they derived a very important theorem called Shannon's theorem now, that a band-limited continuous signal, if it is sampled at this Nyquist rate, which is a very prescribed rate, that depends on the bandwidth of the signal can be recovered exactly from its samples. Of course, this is in a no noise situation. I'm just trying to reconstruct from these numbered samples here my original signal. And this happens by putting the sampled points, convolving them with something, in other words, filtering them, and then this equality is exact. You've reconstructed, you've interpolated, but you haven't lost or generated any information from this sampling. Um, just to run a quick example here, I took three sinusoids with three different periods and summed them all together. And then I sampled them. I took samples every 4,000 years in this 500,000 year interval, so I have 128 samples on the left. And on the right is just simply the periodogram, Fourier transform, absolute value squared. And as you can see, you recover the location of the peaks exactly, pretty well. Um, there is a variance with every one of these measurements. And so while I put in the same power for everything, uh, this graph comes out with um, these peaks um, slightly varying. This is oversampled. If I downsample 8,000 years, I can still find the original peaks. However, of course, if I am past this Nyquist rate, if I'm at 16,000 years, I have now no longer the capability of resolving that shortest time 
uh, period. It is now rather folded into the um, uh, recovered uh, periodogram by this effect known as aliasing. Right? This is essentially well known. If you're looking for cycles in data, for periods, for power spectra, and I've dealt a lot with those as Jerry was alluding to, anything that has a, a spectral representation is uh, subject to this. And if you're going to study these processes and sample them, you need to fit your sampling strategy to the process at hand. Nobody in their right minds will take an ice core and try to find a, 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 a 40,000 year oscillation and only take time points every 800,000 years apart. However, I'm going to show you how this paradigm that's been around for a long time can actually be relaxed significantly, and this will help us in driving Earth models, as I'm going to show you. So question two, the broad scale question is, what can we learn in more general detail from noisy, incomplete, inaccurate observations of geophysical signals? Same notation here, my signal of space and time, that's the truth, let's say, the solution. And I'm going to get data. My data will be some function of that, and let's call it f. And this could be sampling and discretization, followed by linear modeling or nonlinear functions, you know, seismic tomography, anything that goes into forming the data, and then adding noise. That is the data. How do we get from the data back to the truth? So that's, of course, a, a, a general first-year type of question of, of geophysical inverse theory. We need to try and find the inverse that undoes the operation F, which worked once again on this hypothetical truth with some noise added, and we need to go back. And the larger class of inverse problems where this is hard, I'll just call all of them ill-posed, and um, in a few words, it will just be whenever it is really hard to recover the truth or to learn the true nature of the process being modeled from its uh, data. This could be because the data is inaccurate, because it's not enough of it, or uh, because you're not doing it right. What if we're doing such problems? Well, generically, let me just specify this operator to a linear system. The classical data is a linear transform of some model or some model parameters or rather, this is the model and this is the solution, plus some noise, and we need to find an estimate of whatever produced those data. Now come William Ockham and Tikhonov, two uh, names that come up in this context, and they had very particular views on this problem. Ockham said the following, and since our motto is in Latin, I'll uh, track it down in Latin. It basically said that if you have multiple competing hypotheses, select the simplest ones. And of course, that's under the caveat that the hypotheses are equal in all other respects, such as fitting the data to an equal uh, misfit. And then Tikhonov, whose name got uh, associated with this type of approach, has, um, said, let's regularize these inverse problems. And how do we regularize it? By the assumption of prior information. And one form that this takes, typically, is by the addition of a suitable damping or smoothing operator. Um, so these two uh, people here just essentially said the following. Let's minimize the data fit, or rather maximize the fit, minimize the misfit. Make a model and make sure that when you predict what the data should be, that in the mean square error, that there should be a very, very low mean square error. But because this operation through inversion may not always be possible due to this ill posedness, you're going to have to assume something else. So how about adding a quadratic penalty to it, such as keep the model small, or keep the model smooth, or keep various derivatives of the model to a minimum. And that's called the L2 penalty because these are all quadratic norms here. So this is um, what has been going on for a long time also. That's the sort of standard way of treating these uh, problems. But then about 10 years or so ago, a variety of mathematicians, and I just picked two known ones, Emmanuel Condes and uh, Terence Tao, got together and proved um, a whole variety of, of, of theorems that actually jump-started this field, as uh, Jerry was saying, potentially again, because the ideas have been around for a long time. 
And they said the following, forget these quadratic mis uh, model norms that you add to your problem to find a solution when otherwise it wouldn't work. Let's just try to penalize uh, or promote sparsity, penalize the lack of sparsity. And so now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to try to fit the data, some quadratic misfit criteria overall. That's, once again, our main goal. But if we add the following constraint, if we add the L0 norm of the data, uh, or of the model to it, then we're going to ask for that model, which is simple, when simple is defined as very few components in it matter. So that's different from constraining derivatives or, or L squared norm is just saying, if my model has 10 parameters, I prefer that over one that has 11 parameters if the data fit is the same. Now, you know, this idea has been around for a long time, but it's really been hard to do this computationally. And what uh, Condes and Tao came up with is by saying, we can't really do this problem with maximizing sparsity by minimizing the L0 norm. But Let's have a surrogate. Let's, let's, let's take, um, let's say it's about OK to replace this by the f uh, L1 norm. In other words, the sum of the absolute values of the, of the model. It turns out that under certain conditions, and these are all easily met in the problems that I'll be discussing, that by replacing this problem of L2 data misfit plus L0 of the model, looking for sparse models, that if instead you do L2 plus L1, and then you iterate that you get to that solution which fits the data at the required level to call it a fit, while being out of all those possible models that might have that same data misfit, the sparsest one in the L0 sense. So computationally, this has a lot of promise. But is this, so when, when you talk about an inverse problem and you're looking for resolution, one of the issues is how many independent pieces of information do you have? So is this getting at the same issue? I mean, if your resolution matrix tells you have 3.2 as a trace, don't look for any more than three parameters. Yes, but so that may mean that you have done the inverse problem if you can take your you know, trace. And uh, in this case, as I, I'll show you, it's about finding out which ones will matter, where to target your inversion to it. Um, so of course, it's all connected. These are now some practical al algorithms that allow us to do this for massive systems, as I'll show you, and that will tell you where to go for these uh, components. So I'm going to uh, give you a, a, a couple of examples. Here's this, this first one. Let my model, or rather my solution vector, S, let that be some sparse truth. Let that be out of 100 possible values. Let that take 10 components that matter. And let my forward model, my operator that maps the parameters of my solution into the data, let it be this random matrix. So it takes 100 possible model parameters and constructs out of there 20 data points. And of course, this now, this could be a seismic forward model. This could be banana donuts, ray pads, this could also just be simply sampling, in which case you would pick one on every row. So, but by allowing for complete randomness, of course, um, uh, it's just a little bit more general. And so then I construct out of this uh, 10 peaks that you've seen, apply the forward model to it, and then add 20% noise to it, produce the data, and then I try to invert it. And the classical Occam-type Tikhonov solution will do this data misfit, to, this, to some level that's acceptable, and then it'll minimize the norm of the solution, and you get that, which is it's fitting the data just fine because it was very noisy, and the model itself, this model matrix F, was a random combination, so you don't expect to see anything with your bare eye, and that's the solution. But by letting go of the squared additional penalty parameter and instead going for the uh, L1, you get this as a recovery, very simply you find the peaks where they belong with a little bit here and there of spurious peak introduced by the noise. But each of these models, this one and that one, explain the data identically to the same model misfit. In one case, I chose a quadratic extra piece of information to deal with the opposedness. And in this case, I'm um, taking the L1 penalty. 
And so if we know that the model is sparse, if we know that something has certain peaks and only a small set of it, in principle, all of these techniques should be working. So um, these are going to be bullets now, but this is a, a brief summary here. We used to solve noisy inverse problems with insufficient or inconsistent data with this quadratic regularization. Most seismic models of the Earth are made using that. Most of anything, most of deconvolution, most of uh, uh, geodetic, geomagnetic models are all having some quadratic regularization. But if the signal that we want to model is sparse in some basis, then we are going to have a benefit from using L2 and L1, and uh, we should really regularize towards sparsity. So the formal definition of sparsity may be this L0 norm, the sum of the non-zero entries, um, or rather the sum of the number of non-zero entries. Uh, but combining it with L2 is practically really tough, so combining it with L1 works much better, and L1 is just the sum of the absolute values of the model. The implication is sparse signals can be sampled randomly given certain conditions because, of course, it will depend on the sparsity and it will depend on the kind of randomness. And that is called compressed sensing. And we are essentially letting go of Nyquist and Shannon in terms of what that meant. And uh, please. Why not use L1? Well, that's a Yeah, you know, but so this, this is still. Um, uh, as, as we'll see, the algorithm that actually solves the L2, L1 is also amenable to linear programming. And so, but yes, many combinations. It has certain statistical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so now you are going to say, okay, well, show me the sparsity, right? Show me that either my Earth is sampling something sparsely or my Earth model is sparsity. And I'm going to give you my private viewpoint of this. Um, uh, compressed sensing, if it depends on the chosen basis, let's just see some bases. If it depends on the signal, let's just see some signals. So this is back to work I did with spherical harmonics and turning them into localizing basis functions. This map, which is not nicely colored in this view here, is the um, magnetic field of the Earth, one component of it, between the spherical harmonic degrees 17 and 72. And on the left is the map of what you might see if you walked with a magnetometer over land. And on the right is its representation in terms of spherical harmonics, which are functions that depend on order and degree that tell you where the, uh, or rather the pattern of distribution. And so that's what this is completely equivalent to. And the spherical harmonic basis works very well for global fields like this one. Um, no problem. Global basis, it's good for global problems. Um, here are some examples of the spherical harmonics evaluated on that circular area, because I didn't point it out. But if you look at this circular area, that is the location of something called the Bongi anomaly in the lithospheric magnetic field, which is a, is a puzzling feature. but you will agree with me that it stands out above the global field. And let's now try to study this local feature. These spherical harmonics evaluated over Africa have all sorts of values. They're global functions. You know, this is a random selection of them. So this is the typical rendition of spherical harmonics, except now it's just over Africa. And you will need to sum a whole lot of them to just capture the structure inside of this circle, which is what I've done here. If I'm trying to cancel out all of the effects of the field outside of this area by judiciously combining spherical harmonics so that they pile up and give me exactly that Bongi anomaly, that's what you get. And now you see that this is in no way a sparse basis. This is still the spherical harmonics. It's a global basis. It's bad for local problems because I'll need 5,000 odd coefficients just to tell me something about the structure in this region when 5,000 coefficients describe me everything for the Earth. So I haven't gained anything by zooming in. In the last several years, um, starting with the work that I did with Mark Wizorek and then Tony Dolan and various others, we developed a series of basis functions that actually did pile up in the region. And here is a, a selection of them. Much like the spherical harmonics, of which they're just linear combinations, so they're just keeping the 
idea of wavelengths. They're keeping the idea of harmonic functions, but I'm just linearly combining them to make sure that they're big inside of the target region. They're also beautiful, and this is what they look like. So I'm going to gain by expanding the Bongi anomaly into this set of functions without any loss of information. And indeed, that's what I do. That is the same anomaly. If I care to check the misfit in the space domain, it would be something like minus 9, 10 to the minus 9 percent. So it's essentially an exact representation. And I get all of this information inside of the region from just about 100 coefficients in this new basis. So I've now created sparsity by understanding that my problem needed a local basis rather than a global basis. And I found the best projection onto something that turns out to have a reduction of uh, 5,000 to 40 or so meaningful coefficients. So this is an example of the Slepian basis about which we have published a lot, which is a local basis which keeps the uh, idea, the notion of a degree and an order and a wavelength and a harmonic function, but rather than being globally oscillatory, is locally sensitive by prescription, as we have now done. And so now I have generated the required sparsity. Just for those of you interested, there's a picture I've never shown in a talk, but how do I transform this spherical harmonic basis to the Slepian basis? Well, let's say it's just an orthogonal transform. So I'm going to have a matrix, and this is what it looks like. If I put in on the, in the column space, or, or, well, rather, here ordered are all the spherical harmonics, and here would be ordered all these new functions, and this is the transformation that I generate. You see, it's a completely full matrix for those of you who are aficionados of, of these transformations. Completely full, I can actually generate it by counter-rotating the anomaly back to the North Pole, where I have restored the full symmetry of the problem. Now it's completely sparse itself, but that's a bit of another story. The transformation itself is really almost diagonal and very banded and very, very sparse if you choose where and how to generate it. But let that be an aside. So just to re recap for you, in the spherical harmonics, this local function needs a lot of expansion functions, which don't add to the information. But after transformation, I can deal with this representation in just a handful of these new functions. You know, that was us. That, that's me doing it. That's me designing a basis to target a specific region. But let's now try. And, and, and this is also, you know, it's being used very widely. It's, it's very useful. But let me try to look for some processes in geophysics that are sparse in this basis by their very nature without me trying to design something for it. And so as soon as we had formed these Slepian functions by concentration, a localization, I noticed a similarity between the top and the bottom here. So what's the top? A, B, and C are normal mode as in seismic normal modes based predictions of the uh, gravitational potential perturbation due to a moment tensor earthquake located at the center point of a unit magnitude when the moment tensor m here is broken down in its monopole dipole and quadrupole components as is done ever since uh, adam came up with this sort of look i believe in the in the early 70s um, now, as opposed to seismology, which would use this representation to try to predict uh, seismograms, motion of the Earth, I've used this now to predict the potential perturbation onto, um, onto the, uh, of, of the Earth. And so um, any earthquake is now going to be a linear combination of components like this and their uh, rotations. And so it's just too uncanny that these functions that are completely uh, have nothing to do with one another, this is a solution to a particular problem in, in, um, in Earth deformation and potential theory. And these are these purely geometrically constrained functions, but they look very much alike. So that suggests that if I'm going to look at data from global gravity, time variable gravity, as in perhaps from the gray satellite, that if I look for patterns in a basis that is tuned to this sort of motion that I might just well find the record of large earthquakes in it. And so this is, in fact, what we've been trying. 
I'll show you one example or two for Sinatra here. So this is by projection. We take the time variable potential field data from the gray satellites. They orbit the Earth and they record over time how the gravitational acceleration varies with, um, with position, x, and time, t. So it's a time series and this is about five odd years of it. And I'm going to project the time series just for illustration purposes onto the first two of these functions that I made for the region of these Slepian functions. And right away, you see the jump associated with the um, earthquake at uh, uh, the time of its occurrence. And because the bases are rotationally invariant, I can just rotate them and then rotate them. And so if I rotate them to this point, I almost null the signal on this component. And I've made a directional measurement of what directionally dependent gravitational anomaly is caused by, in this case, the Sumatran earthquake. And by reading off this jump here, I can attach a potential perturbation to it. So from projection onto this basis, you can infer the strike of this earthquake, and you can infer its magnitude. And of course, we project onto all of the other basis functions to construct a complete picture. But it's just sort of nice that these completely geometrically constructed functions happen to know something about the physics, or rather, they're so similar to this earthquake problem that we could use them right away to look at earthquake structure. It's a pretty small area. Yeah. It's like you just use local Cartesian coordinates and signs and cosines. Do you notice a Well, so what, what happens is that when you do this and you do it properly, you are not making any of the approximations that you need to do when you do that sort of Cartesian thing. When, what people are doing, and they have done this also in this earthquake, which is so large that, of course, anyone saw it, is they have had to rely on spatial filtering to uh, get rid of, uh, among others, striping in the satellite. Um, and then they have a planar projection. And then they filter that some more with some Gaussian kernels. And then they look at the difference. And then they come up with something that is very dependent on the filtering. This isn't at all filtered. This is projected onto a basis that happens to be attuned to it because it's in the right place. Um, so you get. Um, but there must be some limit to which the area is so small. Oh, clearly. But the Cartesian oh, yeah, yeah. No, this isn't about spherical versus Cartesian. And in fact, we have redone all of the Slepian functions for 2D Cartesian where they are need to be applied. Yes, this is not about Cartesian. This is about uh, lack of arbitrariness selection and filtering, which normally goes on when people have done Cartesian. Um, so, and so now I can move my bases around and see where I pick up and lose the signal. And that's what I've done here, for instance, is I'm tracking down all these strike measurements done in this, in this, time, in this, um, in this panel here. And so I've, I've moved the bases on this grid. And every time I record a significantly directionally dependent jump in the, in the gravity field, I'm tracking what turns out to be sig quite nicely the, uh, the um, sumatra Anaman uh, trench here, where there is not much. There isn't much, but, and as this is the show here that I haven't filtered anything here, there are some severe stripes associated with the satellite tracks themselves. And the, um, uh, putting it all together, this would be the observed gravitational anomaly, and this would be a purely seismologically based uh, prediction of it. And so as you can see, we're starting to move towards being able to use run-of-the-mill gravity solutions from GRACE, projecting them onto a right basis in which things like large earthquakes, potential perturbations are sparse, and then immediately, without much trouble, recover something that we can then study for its complementarity with uh, seismic inversions, which are just based on ground motion. As an example, this is work with a graduate student at Ohio State, Lei Wang here. Um, just some more examples here. This is for the, the Maule earth earthquake in, in Chile. And of course, the time series aren't very long. But the same thing is going on. We're projecting what initially is, of course, a very seasonally modulated signal onto the first, second, third of these Slepian functions and where the function itself is very uh, asymmetric, where it has that, that up-down pattern that I showed you in the pattern, you're seeing a significant 
jump in the um, coefficients of it. And so once again, that is what we measure and characterize in terms of signal to noise, in terms of um, that is the signal due to the earthquake. Um, this is then after we've done it for all of those coefficients. So each of those bases functions now has a coefficient associated with it. And then when we re-expand that in space, then we have this version of what the um, uh, Chilean earthquake, 2010 earthquake, did to the Earth's gravitational field. Um, I'll show you a cross-section through it, the profile. It perturbed the gravity by some number of microgals. This is at a particular um, uh, latitude here, 26 uh, south, I believe. And so this bluish line here is what our technique recovers from uh, the GRACE observation. And then these various dotted lines are predictions from people who um, predict what the gravitational potential perturbation should be based on purely seismic models and perhaps some GPS thrown in also to try and constrain the slip on that fault. And so this is one of those examples where predictions range, six, seven, eight, you know, you could find various predictions for what the slip on this fault should be. And once again, that itself is an inverse problem. But completely independently, we have made one more measurement that constrains this part of the uh, earthquake as well by this procedure that I just uh, described to you. Well, the, I, I, what I don't like about the multi-step smoothing analysis is that when you filter, you lose. You, you move around information, and you are no longer objective. Here, this is a way of letting the data and the nature of the model decide what shall be statistically significant, and then call that the model. So any usual way of dealing things comes with and then I have a Gaussian filter of 300 radius and uh, this much of asymmetry and oh, I've downweighted this and you know, this doesn't. This is just taking all of the data, putting it in, projecting it onto a basis that works well for it and collecting the result. And it seems to work very well. So the answer is that it depends on the smoothing that you apply to the base state in that traditional approach. Yes, and the fact that you pick that smoothing based of, on largely does it look good criteria, which is not a good motivation. Ah, well, so that's the beauty of these slipping functions. They are combinations of spherical harmonics. We haven't lost any of the properties. We haven't lost any algorithms of computing them. It works great. They are not, they're just orthogonal transforms of spherical harmonics. But you could nonetheless simply stay with the Yes, uh, we have a paper where we do that too, where we try to use the slipping functions as local filters. Because gravity does have local. Yeah, yeah, but. Well, but that's how much of the assumption we put in there. That's our prediction. That is what an earthquake does of a unit magnitude. And then we can scale it to the right magnitude. But that's the signature of the earthquake when predicted to those same L equals 60 or so harmonics. Anything above, thanks to orthogonality, isn't going to show up. Anything below is included. So that's uh, the forward model is accurate. Hmm. This one? Well, this plus is just a prediction, right? No, that's right. Yeah, and so the 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 in this case, the geometry of the region, circular, you know, determines what we're starting. Then we have the choice of the radius of the solution. If you change this radius, you're going to get slightly different functions because clearly the larger you get, the easier it is to fit low harmonics in it. But then it's the statistics of varying that and how well that explains the time series of the data themselves that determine what the accurate, or rather what the best size is of that circle. So in this case, for illustration, I literally just pick this radius to match visually with that. For the analysis, um, the uh, radius was varied, and then the criterion applied was how does this variance 
compare with this jump and that variance, and we do that for every component, and we try again for a different location, and we try again for a different radius size, and we try again for a different spectral aperture, or rather upper degree cutoff. Um, but, but nevertheless, I think what, what, what Adam was just identifying is what I was going to touch upon, is we are, we are essentially coming in with a prescribed geometric a priori, we're going to look for circular regions in this case, or we're going to look for Africa-sized or shaped regions, or as we're doing right now, we're looking for Greenland-shaped functions that well capture um, things like melting ice caps, as we're working on, or these large earthquakes, or sea surface height, because those slapping functions can be defined for the entire ocean surface, and so we're, we're actually doing that also. Um, but uh, we'd really like to step away from the prescribed boundary. And so here is the more properly seismological um, application. For seismic tomography, while we have had many successes in parameterizing seismic anomalies with spherical harmonics, there's no reason why we should have spherical harmonics, especially that spherical harmonics, they're harmonic, which means they're going to give you harmonic things like uh, density variations, and there's also anharmonic density variations that aren't picked up by satellite gravimetry, but that may be caused by real seismological heterogeneity. So we're not married to spherical harmonics. Um, and in medical uh, and standard image processing, wavelets in general have been having a lot of success in analyzing and parameterizing uh, and multi-resolution representation of images. Now, of course, wavelets and image processing is going to be a 2D Cartesian viewpoint, and putting wavelets on the sphere has been done, but it hasn't typically been very efficient, and it typically um, has either opted for spherical harmonics to wavelets or uh, sort of a, not ad hoc but flexible filtering of wavelets. And what we decided to do is to try and build one more transform, the last of the transforms, that would allow us to, to um, look at the Earth as a ball. So on the surface, um, we start from a grid, which is a well-known grid called the cube sphere, which is using computational seismology. Uh, Jeroen Trump, when he was here, used it, still uses it, and in a variety of other applications, um, ocean modeling, so much. And because of the tolerable distortion of this grid on the sphere, and then we move that grid down inside of the sphere, we can actually just use Cartesian wavelet transforms in the two dimensions and then the third one on it. And so now we can open ourselves up to the study of this volume of the Earth using a combination of traditional wavelet algorithms. And then, as you'll see, I'll combine it with these L2, L1 um, techniques. So here is one example of one construction that puts, once again in Africa, a bunch of wavelets at different scales at this one position in the center of it. And any function will be able to get decomposed into functions like this and their translates. That's called the wavelet transform. And whatever the expansion coefficient is of this one at that point, I'm going to put at the right location in this 2D grid for which I'm setting you up with, to the tune that an n by n map of data is going to be equivalent to an n by n map of wavelet coefficients. And their location and their scale will tell me where my information is. So I'm going to show you this for the Earth's topography. We all know this one. So here is the topography of Africa. Um, once again, it's expanded from some spherical harmonics. The color bar isn't chosen to be uh, pretty, but this is essentially the topography of, of, of Africa at a certain scale. And here I've broken it down into this wavelet construction on the sphere. And as you can see, fine scale, diagonal, horizontal, vertical derivatives show up, and then it sort of gets very messy. And these n squared numbers are transformed to n squared numbers. And here's a histogram of the positive and the negative coefficients under this transform. So now you go, OK, this is fine. This is a wavelet uh, transform, but you, know, you haven't had any sparsity yet, which is the point of the talk, so I'm going to introduce it now. If I take my signal, which is the Earth's topography, I wavelet transform it, and then I just throw out the low values. I'm doing an operation called thresholding, which is not a linear operation. 
and I'll sh you'll show you the effect of it. So here's, I'm throwing out 25% of the data, and I'm only making a root mean square error in reconstructing my model, which is topography, to 0.4%. I haven't lost any information yet, and yet I've thrown out 25% of the data, or rather the numbers. If I throw out 50, 85, I'm doing a perfect job, you know, 5% error, which is something in a model we can tolerate, of representing this topography. And yet, I've just thrown out all the low value coefficients, which I no longer need to store, handle, invert for, look for, position. Of course, I can go too far. If I keep threshold in 95, 99, I no longer have a representation of Africa that's going to be satisfying. But somewhere in there is a magical threshold level that will give me the right resolution. And it's now our goal to see where this thresholding can be applied such that a seismic model, as I'll be making, satisfies the data. So before we do that, we need to ask ourselves, are Earth models really sparse? Right? Is the Earth sparse? Nobody knows, but we're going to look for a sparse representation of it. So here I'm showing you one layer through uh, Montelli's model. P wave speed anomaly in the traditional colors of fast is, 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 is blue and, and slow is red. And uh, we tried a whole variety of these thresholds. And the example here, which isn't rendering too well, is after 95% thresholding. So we've left, um, we're only working with 5% of the numbers in the whole problem. And we get virtually no error in representing our target. When we do that, on a different model, this is the Jeroen Ritzema's model, we get similar behavior. In other words, we can keep throwing out stuff along the x-axis here and not touch the norm of what we're representing until it really gets too bad. And then at 0, of course, you have 100% error norm. So somewhere along this line lies this optimal level of thresholding, which is that optimal level of damping that we're going to be looking for when making models like this for the Earth. Of course, the side benefit is that we can now study the distribution. Yeah? What's the benefit of trying to represent these anomalies? Uh, I, am, I am taking, your, in this case, I'm taking your one's model, your Ritzema. I'm expanding it. And uh, then I'm wave transforming it. And then I have a certain set of numbers. I have 9,800 numbers, 98,000 numbers. So I have a set. And then I'm trying to throw out the low values of it. And because of the transform, which introduces the sparsity, there's a whole lot of useless ones. And when I throw out 95% of those numbers, I'm pretty much left with the same number. So that's good. That means that is a sparse set that represents this model very well. And in terms of setting up an inversion, I'd rather target those numbers than all of those numbers. That's just a proof of concept that things are indeed. So, but you somehow needed to represent the full model using 98,000. Yeah. So these are not. Yeah. So these are not, of course, harmonics. This is actually a spatial expansion yeah, up to the equivalent Nyquist on the sphere. Yeah, but it, then it turns out that you know because you, you could easily uh, represent. Oh, I don't know what the third harmonics. But well, this is 41 squared. But what you cannot do is you cannot describe one half of the Earth at that L equals 40 and the other half of the other. So this is the point that I'm still getting to is that not only is there this redundancy thanks to sparsity, but because it's wavelets, as you've seen them in their 2D, they're done after a while. They're completely local. So where I don't have this resolution needed for the data fit, I won't introduce it. That's the key point. Indeed. And another, uh, as a benefit, we can also, of course, study the, the, the scale-dependent heterogeneity in these seismic um, models. And I'm actually going to skip over that. This is a slide I stuck in at the last minute. I, I will return to it if you have any questions. But because we've broken down the Earth by scales, this is all orthogonal functions, so we can now study 
the scale length of heterogeneity as a function of depth. Clearly, to first order, we're seeing lots of heterogeneity in shallow, well-mixed mantle, low frequency um, structure near the core mantle boundary. But explaining the graph well is taking more time than I'm going to um, do here. So this is our next goal in, in global seismic tomography is to use this whole set of ideas. So let's try to fit all of the various data, which is multi-frequency, multi-resolution, which is multi-P versus S versus surface waves versus splitting functions, which can be very noisy, which can be spatially heterogeneous. And in this basis, we're going to try and find the sparsest set of coefficients that satisfies this data under the constraint that its wavelet coefficients are going to be few in number, and as a surrogate will take, their sum of their absolute value will be low. So in other words, we're going to try to do this for the seismic global earth model. Find that solution. That's the argument of the minimum mean square error in the data fit, and then some uh, sparsity constraint on top of that. And here's the algorithm, which is sort of interesting to look at. It's very, very simple. It's some kind of a conjugate gradient. You start from some solution. You operate on it with the forward model. You compare with the data. It's not good. You apply with the transpose, not the inverse, of the same operator. And you add that to the previous one. You wavelet transform. And then you threshold. And that's your next one. Or rather, that's the wavelet transform of your next one. So the thresholding here is at every step saying, let's just throw out the low values. And over time, as the algorithm progresses, it comes up with the sparsest set that explains the data to the prescribed um, data fit. And all of that is done with a few forward wavelet transforms, which are very fast. And uh, it's also done without having to invert anything, which uh, means it's ready for massive problems, where in the trials that we're doing now, these matrices F have something like 100,000 rows. And in a typical block-based parameterization, you might need 6 million model parameters to grid the Earth. Um, and here we do, with this sparsity-seeking algorithm, we're doing um, not that. So as a toy example here, the last one of the toy examples, I'm going to give you a model that is uh, from uh, some of Jean Autrampère's work not on a pretty color scale, but let that be the truth. And let this here be the density of sampling, which is also realistic. It's also taken from a, a published paper of surface wave paths circling the globe. And this is the log of the density with which the rows of the matrix are filled. And so you have lots of data arriving in the US, lots of earthquakes, lots of varying um, structure. And it's highly heterogeneous. Um, and so in some areas, you're going to expect high resolution. Some areas, you're going to expect lower resolution. The point of this exercise is just at this point to try if the algorithm works. And so all we need from it right now is that it reproduces the input after adding noise to it. And so that's the um, solution. So this, is, this was for us the first time that on a realistic scale of experiment, we could apply this new wavelet transform the new uh, norm criterion, the new thresholding algorithm, the whole iterative scheme, all in realistic situations. The output is then to be compared with the input. And so not only do we explain the data very well that we generate, but we're also able to reproduce our input. Now, clearly, the next question will be, what if we cut a chunk out of this model. What if we you know, cut various data? Now, we still need to be standard tomographers to appraise our solution once we put in real data. But at least in the synthetics and on actual scale models, massive data sets, this sort of stuff um, or these sorts of ideas now work. Ray patch. Can you show again the ray patch? So you basically have nothing. Well, it's, it's so no. See, the colors are really poorly chosen. It's actually a log ten of the density of the column density, and so there is a lot of them here, and I see them. Well, but, I see yeah, those. But there, I don't see those in the south of London. There is a few coming through, but the, it, it's a color bar issue. If you plot it, whether or not you have data, the plot will be almost black. It's it's the same data set that, okay. of the Trump Air ninety seven. In fact, the identical. 
not the best ever, but once again, for surface waves, it wasn't too bad. Could have taken a different no, no. Uh, well, Anyway. Uh, yeah. It's heterogeneous in its density. That's the main, main OK, so uh, I'm going to wrap up. I'm a little bit too late. Um, but the first thing was to try to find bases under which models were sparse. The second thing was, is our Earth sparse? Let's use some of those bases. And then let's relax the assumption of needing to decide where they're concentrated or what area we're looking at. We'll just let the model completely free and let the solution try to fit the data and be sparse at the same time. And this, uh, for large scale 3D problems, is what we're setting up to do to actually produce new models that combine the best of various available data sets. So that's work in progress. I'm going to attack a little bit at the end where, you know, instead of deriving that single best model, this is what Jerry introduced us, me as uh, the work with Bob Kopp here, let's just try to sample the posterior distribution of having this truth in case uh, here, this would be paleo sea level, given a variety of data. And so I have two more gentlemen to introduce you, Thomas Bayes and Albert Tarantola, who would probably hate to see themselves on the same picture. However, um, both of these had variations on the idea that modeling is about producing data from known inputs uh, in some probabilistic sense starting from some prior on what all it could be, and then sampling the distribution of all of those solutions that would fit that data. And uh, Albert lectured at Princeton for, for a semester, and every day he wrote equations like this, and every day he claimed he was not a Bayesian. So it was slightly incongruous, but um, so Sparsity throws us a sparse data set. This is what Bob Kopp and Adam Maloof put together, is all of the available data that they could find in doing the last interglacial. I'll show you the precise time frame in, a, well, in, in this graph here, 120. These are the intervals, 128 uh, thousands of years ago. And at every point, we have one or more data sets. And the statistics of it is very messy. They're not very good. They're limiting points. They're broad. Uh, uncertainties, they're up to this point, you know. Um, and from that, our task was to reconstruct the history of sea level. So this isn't a standard inverse problem where we can sort of maybe, um, well, I wouldn't know what to invert. And this isn't a standard interpolation problem, because if you try to interpolate, you're not going to get anything unless you assume a lot of things. But what we did start by knowing is that when sea level is recorded as to this level, plus or minus this, at this time, and sea level is recorded there as to this level, plus or minus this much, at that time, and the temporal uncertainty of each of those points are what they are, then the two are somehow linked because sea level cannot go from this point at this time to that point at that time without satisfying basic constraints of physics, of how sea level changes. And so that's when we had the fortune of, well, coming to Jerry, but I'm going to just sum this up for you. The day is very noisy, certainly incomplete, it's both spatially and temporal coverage. It's an undoable problem, in fact, when you thought about it properly. Um, we need to know how the data is connected, and as I was just trying to argue, this is by the physics of sea level change. One data point is not operating in isolation, because the whole solid Earth mediates what happens to it and its neighbors, and the whole history of of how it changes, mediates what changes. So we want to try to learn as much as possible about the covariance structure of having any data in any of these positions at all. And in terms of prior solutions of what sea level may or may not do, we can build, as we did, histories of ice melting, this ice cap, this ice cap, perturbed with various uh, perturbation parameters, constrained by global isotope uh, curves to try and keep at least volume constraint rights. and, and um, and then we just run it. Then we sample thousands and thousands of these histories in a way that comes up with an inverse of the problem in the sense that some model satisfies the data, but of course without ever having formulating the inverse. And so this is the example of where nature gives us a compressed sensed sample, and we are trying to undo it because we know it isn't sparse, it's rather sea level that varies. 
And then Jerry said, um, just let me do this because I know how to include all the gravitational, elastic, isostatic, all of this good stuff that makes sea level computations hard, given it melts here, what does it do there? And then. So we provided the modeling exercise with lots and lots of different models, which became the prior. And here is all this modeling that goes on in predicting what melting does to sea level, which includes, of course, all of the dynamic Earth and various perturbed parameterized versions of it. And then we sample the posterior. And this is a very long story, very short. But we came up with, indeed, not just a sea level curve, but with a distribution of sea level curves. And so this paper, um, let's read it from 110 to 135. This central interval is the area where we had good data. In fact, the data at all is just marked as crosses here. And so the shadings here are individual models that satisfy the data and that together define a cloud, which is not a Gaussian cloud. It's not even a unimodal cloud in certain things. Yet we have a most likely model of sea level variations globally, which is the central curve. And we can do things like plus or minus in terms of um, uh, capturing a certain uh, volume of models within it. But we arrive at global sea level, at rates of change of global sea level, and at potentially, but not as confidently, the individual contributions on whether or not it was more of this versus that producing that sea level. And uh, the, the reason this paper got you know, pressed in the end is that, oh, this was ever so slightly higher, I suppose, by maybe 50% than people have been asserting in terms of this type of a environment with this much warming that is not unlikely to occur in our future must have produced, and then we read these numbers, at least this much of global sea level. And so we translated these curves now into probabilities of what can we expect. If the last interglacial is anything like what we may be getting into, let's just read probabilities of exceeding a certain sea level on this axis with a certain confidence, and that would be the black line. And so um, I forgot what the number is that the IPCC would, would have you quote as very likely, not so likely, least likely, things like that. But if you pick the, 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 the dire, or as Dick Pelletier uh, uh, told me, he said, you're picking the most frightening situation which is 95 confidence or something, then you have at least, I believe, six or six meters of global sea level rise, as we argued in this paper. But so to sum up, all of that is derived from three different approaches to inverse modeling, all of them needing or capable of handling messy, noisy, incomplete data. In the first part, it was a lot about constructing a basis that would be good for the problem. In the second part, it's by finding the basis, by just satisfying the data and letting the basis express itself where it's required under the L1 penalty. And in the third case, it's about sampling many, many, many models. Each of the three, though, they have the property that they explain the data with a minimal amount of assumptions. And um, that's it, basically, what I have. Thanks for uh, listening. <coughs> Um, we, never, we never tried to go back to that original formulation because we always knew why we were working you know, towards massive data sets. Um, but, but the other thing is this whole, the, the crux to the algorithm that 
it's not just their work. There's much more work, right? But but that adaptive thresholding, that itself is a nonlinear operation. It's it's not just scaling or throwing out. It's it going to be sort of adapted. So there's much more complexity. In it. But yeah, why not go for straight as zero if you want? Doesn't the thresholding introduce an arbitrariness in the sense, the same way that singular value decomposition does? Well, the, the thresholding is something that, as I tried to argue with the, with the topography, where it's somewhat uh, intuitive, it's something that you can set to be dictated by the statistics of what it is that it needs to represent. Topography, and I'm not saying this about seismic models, but topography is some kind of a law of normal distribution under this particular basis. And so the 85th percentile, I know what that means you know, in terms of threshold. But, but you're very right. When we actually do the final algorithm, which has this threshold, this threshold actually evolves over time. Uh, if you track the, the data fit on one axis and the sparsity on, on the other, typically what you get is a, is a slow decrease of the data fit at the expense of sparsity. And then after a while, you return and make the, you, you sparsify something after you found to which level you can explain the data. But the ultimate metric, it's not a decision. The ultimate metric is you explain the data, and it's subjective in the sense that you have found the sparsest. Even though to get to that one, you need to let the thresholding vary, and you know you can do it cleverly. But in the end, you have found the sparsest model that satisfies the data, so you no longer suffer from it your choices along the way. But we are playing a lot. With it's, it's, it's easy to write, but it's actually hard to do, because where and how you threshold these various coefficients, there's a lot of complexity with it to make sure the algorithm converges and works fast. Another question? Cool. No. OK, so as always, we can meet one-on-one -on -one with the speaker upstairs at the reception. So let's 